While early modernist innovations began in Europe, an influx of progressive artists, scientists, and intellectuals all fleeing war-torn Europe brought modernism to New York and the United States. The establishment of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 1929 also marked this pivotal moment because it provided a platform for modern art with exhibitions that showcased avant-garde trends from across the globe. In the first 10 years after the end of the war, much of this innovation was centered in New York, giving rise to the term the New York School. It consisted of two mo movements, abstract expressionism and color field painting. Abstract expressionism is the first modernist movement to originate in the United States. The artists associated with the New York School wanted to create energy and emotion with a universal visual experience that anyone could respond to without needing to refer to or find a parallel for in their own life and their own experience or their own beliefs. Drawing from the diverse influences of Fauvism, German Expressionism, and Surrealism, abstract expressionist artists like Jackson Pollock sought to challenge viewers to engage with art on a visceral and an immersive level. Pollock studied in the 1930s with both Thomas Hart Benton and the Mexican muralist David Sigueros. The rhythmic structure of Benton's style and the mural scale art of Sigueros influenced Pollock's poured paintings of the late 1940s and the early 1950s. Searching for ways to express primal human nature, Pollock also studied Navajo sand painting and psychologist Carl Jung's theories of the unconscious. His belief that he was painting for the age of the atomic bomb in the radio led Pollock to innovate techniques. He created autumn rhythm by using sticks as well as brushes to drip and pour paint onto the canvas. Working on huge canvases placed on the floor, Pollock was able to actually enter the space of the painting physically as well as psychologically. The huge format allowed ample room for sweeping gestural lines. Pollock would pour, he would drip, and he would fling the paint, yet he also exercised control and selection through the rhythmical dancing movements of his body. These paintings evolved organically and spontaneously rather than through any pre-planning. The absence of any recognizable imagery focuses our attention on the actions and the gestures of the artist. The process becomes the subject, making the painting about the act of creation itself. A similar approach in the work of many his, of his colleagues led some to call this movement action painting. The influence of expressionist and surrealist attitudes is evident in Willem de Kooning's spontaneous and emotionally charged brushwork, as well as in his provocative use of shapes. Throughout his career, de Kooning remained committed to abstract imagery, yet the human figure remained a persistent underlying theme of many of his paintings. After a period of working without specific subjects, de Kooning embarked on a series of large-scale painting fe paintings featuring ferocious female figures. These canvases, painted with slashing attacks of the brush, have an overwhelming presence. While these works pulsate with the energy of abstract expressionism, they also provoke controversy due to the monstrous depiction of women that they portray. Lee Krasner's Untitled is a relatively small work. It is a vertical painting, and it consists of tightly painted, gridded crescents of black and white paint with flecks of vibrant color. This painting belongs to a series from the late 1940s that Krasner called Little Images, which is kind of an ironic title, um, especially if we consider how large and heroic in scale were the paintings of leading figures of the time, like Jackson Pollock, whom Krasner married in 1945, and Willem de Kooning. Her process for making this painting stands in contrast to Pollock's approach, whereas he spread his canvases out on the floor and was able to enter the space of the painting, hers were done on a tabletop. So the tightly woven and the interlocking shapes of Untitled have very little of the drip and the sweep of a Pollock or a de Kooning. In this piece, though, every part of the canvas is equally charged with energy. It has no distinct foreground, background, it has no focal point. 
Krasner used te quick textured strokes to shape forms that are reminiscent of a mysterious kind of handwriting. Krasner's painting appears hieroglyphic, as if the artist were repeatedly tracing numbers or letters over and over again across the surface. Her painting may be based on Hebrew letters from her childhood studies, but dissembled in such a way that untitled seems almost similar to the Cold War scrambling of codes. Krasner's abstract rendition of Hebrew could almost be read as a reference to the Holocaust in this way, which represented for many the most unimaginable horror, along with the atom bomb of contemporary life in the 1950s. But even if we or art, histor art historians read these works of art within larger critical or historic frameworks or other personal references, it's important to remember that the artists of the post-war period rejected and resisted such interpretations. Artists sought to break the link between the work of art and the everyday world. This is very different from some of the work that we talked about in the previous section, right? Breaking the link between the work of art and the everyday world. The post-war art critic Clement Greenberg, whose name is synonymous with the term formalism, advocated a non-representational approach to art. For Krasner, who was well-versed in theories of art, little images represented a breakthrough into this new realm, a post-cubist and a post-surrealist abstraction. It could have also been the beginnings of a feminist commentary on the part of the artist. Despite Krasner's centrality to the New York School and her friendship with many of the leading figures in the New York art world in the 1940s and 50s, it would take many years for Krasner to receive the kind of attention that Pollock seemed to warrant almost immediately. The one reality that she could never escape was the fate bestowed upon women artists in an era that was dominated by the heroic male artist. David Smith, for many, is the most important American sculptor of the post-war period, and he was strongly influenced by action painting. His constructed metal sculpture began with a cubist frame framework of overlapping and jagged shapes, and he added the element of energy of abstract expressionism. His use of factory methods and materials provided new options for the next generation of sculptors. Smith's late work included the stainless steel cubi series based on cubic masses and planes balanced dynamically above the viewer's eye level. He scoured the steel surfaces with energetic curving motions as an abstract expressionist might, creating reflective exteriors that seemed to almost dissolve their solidity. Smith intended the sculpture to be viewed outdoors in strong light, and it would have been set off by a lush green landscape. A related painting style that emerged around the same time as abstract expressionism is color field painting. This approach involves large expanses of color without clear structure or focal points, creating immersive and engulfing experiences for the viewer. Artists working in this style, like Mark Rothko, use color to evoke a wide range of emotions, from joy and serenity to melancholy and despair. Rothko in particular achieved remarkable effects by layering extremely thin washes of paint, resulting in compositions that possess both a sensuous appeal and a monumental presence. Instead of relying on energetic brushwork or dynamic compositions, Rothko emphasizes color as the primary means of expression. In this piece, Rothko employs his signature style where large blocks dominate the canvas and they create an immersive visual experience for the viewer. The juxtaposition of these three vibrant and contrasting hues creates a sense of tension and harmony and depth at the same time. It has a luminous quality to it and soft transitions between the colors that create a kind of an atmosphere. Standing in front of them, they encourage contemplation and introspection. They almost invite you to enter them. Rothko once stated, the progression of a painter's work will be toward clarity, toward the elimination of all obstacles between the painter and the idea and between the idea and the observer. Blue, orange, red exemplifies Rothko's exploration of the emotional and spiritual potential of color, and it offers the viewer a direct encounter with the power of pure visual sensation. 
One of the few women to receive recognition during the pinnacle of abstract expressionism was Helen Frankenthaler. One of her most important pieces, Mountains and Sea, this piece was painted in one day following a trip to Nova Scotia, and it really embodies her emphasis on softness and on openness and on the expressive potential of color. She applied the oil paint thinned down with turpentine directly onto unstretched and unprimed canvas. She then tilted and lifted the canvas to move the puddles of paint around rather than using a brush. Because the canvas wasn't primed with gesso, the paint soaked into the weave of the fabric, and this created a sort of emerging between the material and the surface and vibrant and ethereal washes of color. While there are faint suggestions of a landscape in this painting, we can see mountain-like forms, we can see horizon-like indications. The painting itself transcends any literal representation and it invites viewers to immerse themselves into its evocative atmosphere. Even though water and geography did inform many of her compositions, Frankenthaler saw abstraction as a way to focus on formal elements. Frankenthaler's work also serves as a bridge between the gestural spontaneity of abstract expressionism and the controlled application of color field painting. Robert Motherwell's series of paintings titled Elegy to the Spanish Republic is permeated with a tragic sense of history. His elegy is brewed over the destruction of the fragile Spanish democracy by General Francisco Franco in the bloody Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. Heavy black shapes crush and obliterate the lighter passages behind them. Motherwell began with a specific subject as his starting point, and he expressed his inner mood through abstract means. During the 1940s and 1950s, many leading artists opted to stay clear of recognizable subject matter, largely avoiding direct references to the world around them. However, by the mid-1950s, abstract expressionism had dominated the art scene for over a decade, and this prompted some artists to seek new avenues of expression that embraced the visual diversity of urban life. Influential figures like the avant-garde composer John Cage urged artists to create art that celebrated life itself, rather than attempting to impose order on chaos or suggest improvements to creation. Robert Rauschenberg, who came from Port Arthur, Texas, was among those who responded to this call for a broader artistic vision. Rauschenberg's artistic journey took him through various mediums, including painting, sculpture, printmaking, photography, and performance, and his career spanned over six decades. Emerged, emerging during the reign of abstract expressionism, he challenged the dominance of gestural abstract painting and the archetype of the heroic, self-expressive artist associated with that movement. Experimenting with what he termed combine paintings, Rauschenberg incorporated ordinary subjects and collage materials alongside abstract expressionistic brushwork. For instance, in one of his works, he fused a pillow, stuffed a stuffed eagle, newspaper clippings, a metal drum, a flattened paint tube, cardboard fragments, a photograph of his son, and a postcard of the Statue of Liberty. These elements are sourced from the streets of New York and they challenge the non-representational nature of abstract expressionism. They offer viewers familiar objects to identify with, even if they are in a fragmented form. Rauschenberg's landmark series, known as Combines, blurred the boundaries between art materials and everyday items. He considered elements like newspaper texts, photographs, stitches in baseballs, and filaments and light bulbs as fundamental to painting as traditional brushstrokes or ornamental drips. This approach created compositions that reflected the chaotic and disparate nature of modern life, and the disorder of urban civilization became incorporated into the artistic realm. Drawing inspiration from Dada collage artists like Hannah Hosch, Rauschenberg's assemblage art expanded that into three dimensions, and it earned him the label of a neo-Dadaist by some contemporary critics. By embracing the randomness and diversity of urban existence, Rauschenberg challenged notions of art and paved the way for artists such as Andy Warhol, who would take the incorporation of everyday objects and experiences into artworks to a completely new level with the advent of pop art. 
Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns engaged in frequent discussions about art making during their formative years. While Rauschenberg explored the fusion of everyday objects and painterly abstract expressionist techniques in his work, Johns pursued a different avenue, aiming to discover new possibilities for painting. He achieved this by creating paintings that at first glance appear indistinguishable from the objects they represent. Johns astutely employed signs used in everyday visual communication, skillfully blending them with painterly methods to create something entirely unique in both subject matter and technique. One of John's iconic subjects was the shooting target, a familiar image imbued with symbolic significance. By meticulously building up the surface of the target with wax and caustic, John's is transforming it into a tangible object, enhancing its tactile qualities and blurring the lines between representation and abstraction. The bold design, the substantial size and painterly surface of the work evoked the spirit of abstract expressionism, yet the familiarity of the object, the target, grounds it in everyday life. The inclusion of four cropped and eyeless faces above the target adds another layer of complexity to the painting. These are plaster casts that were all taken from life from a single model over several months, and they introduce a sculptural presence that reinforces the objectness of the painting. In John's hands, common subjects such as the shooting target become objects of contemplation. His works, along with those of Rauschenberg, are often categorized as neo-Dada because they draw inspiration from the Dada movement while providing a bridge between abstract expressionism and the emerging pop art movement. The 1960s witnessed a significant rise in the prominence of advertising and mass culture across the Western world, especially in the increasingly affluent society of the era. Magazines and television inundated people with unprecedented amounts of commercial appeals and entertaining popular culture, blurring the lines between art and everyday life. In response to this cultural shift, pop artists emerged, offering their own commentary on mass culture by incorporating real objects or mass production techniques into their art. Drawing inspiration from design and commercial art, fields that were traditionally overlooked by fine artists, pop painters adopted techniques like photographic screen printing and airbrushing to mimic the surface characteristics of mass-produced imagery found in advertising, food labels, and comic books. This slick aesthetic and ironic attitude distinguish pop art from traditional assemblage. Although pop art flourished most prominently in the United States, it initially appeared in London, where a group of young artists began creating collages using images cut from popular magazines. English artist Richard Hamilton played a pivotal role in defining pop art with his 1957 list of characteristics, addressing the qualities of contemporary mass culture that these artists were aiming to critique. Hamilton's collage, just what is it that makes today's homes so different, so appealing, exemplifies this approach, incorporating elements from comic strips, from advertising layouts, from famous brand packages, and other visual cliches of the mass media. The movement derived its name from the word pop, which is prominently displayed on the giant lollipop, reflecting its focus on popular culture and mass media imagery. Unlike the abstract expressionist artists, the artists of the pop art movement embraced everyday subject matter in their artwork in a way that was entirely new for its time. Andy Warhol rose to prominence as one of the most provocative and divisive figures in American art during the 1960s. While not the originator of pop art, Warhol emerged as its most notable and controversial figure. He was initially celebrated as a highly successful commercial artist, but Warhol's transition to fine art brought to the forefront the profound impact of mass media and marketing on contemporary society. Pop artists wanted their subjects to be immediately familiar to their audience, and so they borrowed imagery from popular culture. At the time, there was a division between fine art, which was a supposedly sophisticated part of high culture, and popular culture, which was considered unrefined and ordinary. But pop artists bridged this gap by combining fine art materials with commercial elements and then selling them in galleries. 
Warhol's choice of subjects often revolved around everyday consumer products, such as Coca-Cola and Campbell's soup. Through enlargement and through using silk screening techniques, Warhol would transform these mundane items into objects of fine art. Warhol's exploration of celebrity culture is perhaps best exemplified in his Marilyn diptych, where the actress's face is repeated 50 times in both monochrome and vivid color. This piece serves as a contemplation of the commercialization of fame, suggesting that celebrities are treated as marketable commodities, which at that time may have been a new idea. Celebrities become products for public consumption, with their images manipulated and exploited for financial gain by media outlets. Ultimately, Warhol's repeated use of mass imagery not only reflects the cultural landscape at his, of his time, but it also speaks to the emergence of a new mythology centered around consumerism and the idolization of celebrities. Warhol's art thus becomes a commentary on the omnipresent and relentless nature of commercialization in contemporary life. Roy Lichtenstein's early artistic endeavors were profoundly shaped by the visual language of hand-drawn advertising, then known as commercial art, and the imagery found within comic books. Lichtenstein was intrigued by the stylized portrayals of individuals and objects and the standardized methods that comics use to depict elements like hair, eyes, glass, smoke, explosion, water, and even dripping brushstrokes. One of his most famous works, Wham!, was inspired by a frame from the comic series All American Men of War. Lichtenstein altered the original image by making it larger, using only a few colors and spreading it across two huge canvases. Each one was over 13 feet wide. In order to create gradations of color, Lichtenstein borrowed a technique from older kinds of newspaper printing and comics. This enlargement highlighted the distinctive dot pattern found in comic book printing. These are called Bende dots. So this is a technique where small colored dots are variously spaced and combined to create shading and gradations and colors and images. Lichtenstein created his dots using a stencil and then gives a commercial edge to the technique of pointillism, while the use of primary colors references the color palette of such geometric abstract artists as Piet Modrian. Warhol and Lichtenstein used appropriation to bring recognizable and familiar imagery into galleries and museums. By combining practices of so-called high and low arts, they were able to bridge the gap between the two and expand the boundaries of acceptable fine art practices to include popular imagery and commercial printing processes. Minimalist artists completely rejected the idea of art as a reflection of external things, like the artist personality that the abstract expressionists emphasized or the commercial nature of pop art, and instead, it focused on the intrinsic qualities of color, shape, and material. The movement is posing a fundamental question. Could art exist solely for its own sake, free from external references or any hidden meanings? They sought to use minimal textures, geometric shapes, flat color, and even outsourced mechanical construction to strip away any traces of meaning or emotion in their work. Donald Judd was a prominent figure in the minimalist movement, and he was known for his use of industrial materials like sheet metal, aluminum, and molded plastics. And although he was trained as a painter, Judd generally preferred the medium of sculpture because it existed in actual space. According to Judd, any painting, no matter how abstract, shows something, whereas a sculpture is something in real space. His 1967 piece, Untitled, exemplifies this minimalist approach. It is devoid of narrative. There's no sense of personal expression or symbolic content. He ordered 10 boxes of stainless steel and plexiglass to be made. Each were the same size. And when the piece was installed, it was installed with even spacing between each one that was based on his specifications. As the art world witnessed a further evolution towards the realm of ideas, conceptual art emerged as a natural progression from minimalism. It challenged the traditional notions of art by prioritizing the conceptual over the material object. So instead of painting a canvas or making a sculpture, the artist might arrange objects in a certain way as to make people reconsider each of those objects in a new light. Some conceptual artists focus their efforts on planning rather than even producing artwork. 
The results of conceptual art include or can include documentation, sketches, artist books, photographs, performances, and mail art. So rooted in the ideas of Marcel Duchamp, who had championed art based on concepts rather than physical objects, conceptual art sought to transcend the confines of traditional artistic practice. And one of the pioneers of this movement was Joseph Kossuth, whose work intends to provoke questions more than provide answers and appeal to the intellect more than to the senses. On one level, the piece One and Three Chairs, created in 1965, presents viewers with three things that a chair could be. On the left, it is a photograph. In the middle, or the center, is the actual chair. And on the right is an enlarged dictionary passage with the definition of the word chair. Through this installation, he explored the nature of perception and interpretation. Which of these chairs is more familiar? Which is more real? Which one provides us with the most information? Ultimately, our experience of a chair, what its meaning is, our awareness of how we communicate ideas, and the way all of these things impact art is changed after seeing this piece. Minimal and conceptual works, although revolutionary, continue to be displayed in art galleries. However, during the late 1960s and 70s, a new trend emerged among artists who created works specifically for display outside of conventional art venues. These site-specific artworks are characterized by the artist's direct response to the location, influencing everything from composition to scale to medium and content. For some artists, these site-specific creations served as a form of protest against the materialism that they saw was so prevalent in the art world, which revolves around the buying and selling of valuable objects. By situating their works outside the conventional marketplace, these artists made an implicit anti-capitalist statement. One prominent figure in the site-specific movement was the Bulgarian-born artist Christo, who initially supported himself as a portrait painter before gaining recognition in Paris with the New Realists in the early 1960s. Christo often incorporated fabric into his early works, together with her, his and together with his artistic collaborator and wife, Jean-Claude, began creating temporary artworks in 1961. Among their most ambitious projects was Running Fence, which is featured here. This is a temporary environmental artwork that transcended the traditional notions of sculpture. This 18-foot high white nylon fence spanned 24 and a half miles of agricultural and pasture land in Sonoma County, California, serving as both a visual spectacle and a communal event. The realization of running fence involved extensive logistical coordination, including public hearings, including securing landowner agreements, and the collaborative effort of thousands of individuals. Funding for the project was raised through the sale of early works like preparatory drawings, studies, and collages. This seemingly endless ribbon of white cloth made the wind visible and it caught the changing light as it stretched across the gently rolling hills, appearing and disappearing on the horizon. Running Fence stood for only two weeks, although it ultimately involved thousands of people. The simplicity of the work relates it to minimal art, but the fence itself was not presented as an art object, as it was temporary. Rather, its significance was as a work that involved people, process, object, and place. Although site-specific works can be commissioned, they are almost never resold unless someone buys the land they occupy. Artists who create conceptual art, earthworks, site-specific works, and performance art share a desire to subvert the gallery museum collector syndrome, to present art as an experience rather than as a commodity. While some artists were creating outdoor earthworks, others were moving beyond the traditional concepts of indoor painting and sculpture in other ways. Since the mid-1960s, artists from diverse backgrounds and points of view have created interior installations rather than portable works of art. Some installations alter the entire spaces they occupy. Others are experienced as large sculpture. Most of them assume that the viewer will enter the piece. Yayoi Kusama was born in Nagano Prefecture, a rural and mountainous area west of Tokyo, where her parents owned a large plant nursery. During World War II, Kusama sewed parachutes. 
1948, she began studies at the Kyoto Municipal School of Arts and Crafts, but her art training was sporadic and incomplete. Encouraged by a response from artist Georgia O'Keeffe, Kusama ultimately found her way to New York in search of opportunity for artists. By 1961, she had a studio in the same building as the future minimalist Donald Judd, who was her friend. An early leader in installation, Kusama has had a large and varied career. Through it all, she remains focused on just a few concepts, among them multiplicity and repetition. Her early works used the all-over compositional method of abstract expressionism, but it used, they use them more intimately and more obsessively. A striking example of her work is the Infinity Room Phallus Field, where viewers are immersed in a plethora of dots decorating stuffed phallic forms. While some may regard these dots as mere embellishments, Kusama infuses them with profound symbolism. She says, our Earth is only one polka dot among a million stars in the cosmos. Polka dots are a way to infinity. Despite grappling with mental health challenges, Kusama has discovered solace and purpose in her artistry. Alongside her installations, she has explored various creative forms, including novels, short stories, poetry, and autobiography. In recent years, her installations have evolved to become even more immersive, as we can see in Infinity Mirror Room, filled with the brilliance of life that's pictured here. The addition of darkness, for one, LED lights, pools of water, has made these environments major attractions and has driven a worldwide renewal of interest in her art at this stage in her long career. Her artwork, Infinity Mirror Room, My Heart is Dancing into Darkness, is on view now permanently at the Crystal Bridges Art Museum in Northwest Arkansas. So if you're in the area, I really encourage you to just drop in and check it out. Um, the room itself is small, and it's filled with mirrors and paper lanterns that have dots that can change color. And the effect makes it appear like the dots are expanding forever into the universe. In the late 1960s, many women artists began to speak out against the discrimination they faced in their careers. It was rare for a woman to be taken seriously in artist groups. Galleries were more willing to exhibit the work of men than women, and museums collected the work of men far more often than they did that of women. Moreover, it seemed to the early feminists that making art about their experience as women might doom them to obscurity in a male-dominated art world. So in the early 1970s in New York and California, they began to take action as part of a larger feminist movement. Feminist organizations initially focused on issues like equal rights and equal pay. However, they recognized the power and the influence of visual culture and media, and this led to a broader feminist concern encompassing art and media overall. Women in the art world began organizing efforts to recover women's art from the past, to advocate for more equitable representation in museums and galleries, and to support contemporary women artists. During the early stages of feminism, many artists were intrigued by the idea of creating art specifically rooted in the biological, psychological, social, and historical experiences of women. Judy Chicago's monumental work, The Dinner Party, stands as a testament to this era. Over five years, Chicago collaborated with hundreds of women and several men to create this significant artwork. The dinner party features a large triangular-shaped table, and it's adorned with place settings for 39 women who made significant contributions to world history. The names range from the Egyptian Queen Hatshepsut to novelist Virginia Woolf to artist Georgia O'Keeffe. Additionally, the names of 999 more women of achievement are inscribed onto ceramic tiles below the table. Each place setting includes a hand-embroidered fabric runner and a porcelain plate designed in honor of the respective woman. These plates showcase various designs, some with flat paintings, others with relief motifs, many of them featuring explicit depictions of the female genitalia resembling flowers. By employing craft techniques, such as ceramics, weaving, needlepoint, and embroidery, Chicago challenged the traditional hierarchy of artistic media. The dinner party honors the countless women throughout history who were confined to domestic roles and creative outlets that were considered inferior. 
Chicago's decision to work with clay and textiles was part of a broader reevaluation of crafts that began in 1960. Artists began questioning the longstanding division between art and craft, examining the criteria that defines them. Crafts are traditionally associated with women's work were often ranked below painting and sculpture in the hierarchy of the arts. But in the 1970s, women artists embraced textiles and clay as feminist acts, rejecting the societal devaluation of craft. For Judy Chicago, Miriam Shapiro, and others, challenging the low status of craft was a direct response to the pervasive misogyny within the art world that they aimed to dismantle. The works that artists create exist in the space between the artist and the viewer. In the 1970s, some artists began to wonder if they could do without artworks and address the audience directly. In performance art, artists do not create anything durable or lasting as an object. Rather, they perform actions before an audience or in nature. So in this art form, we have both visual art and drama. And it does have a historical precedent in Dadaist performances of the early 20th century. Performance artists eliminate the object and concentrate on the event itself. The only record is in the remembered experience of the participants or in a few photographs. Anna Mendieta was a significant figure in the realm of contemporary art. She was particularly known for pioneering contributions to body art and to the earth art movements. Through her performances and installations, she explored themes of life, death, and rebirth, often incorporating organic materials like mud, grass, and blood. One of her most renowned series, Silhouetta or Silhouette, involved creating body impressions in various natural settings, leaving imprints that symbolized her presence and connection within the earth. Mendieta's art also addressed issues of feminism, cultural identity, and displacement, reflecting her own experiences as a Cuban immigrant living in the United States. By integrating her personal history and her cultural background into her work, as well as her commitment to addressing social and environmental issues through her creative practice, she contributed to the broader dialogue on diversity and inclusion within the art world. Ending there seems like we are stopping in the middle of something, and in reality, we are. Our journey through the evolution of art from the mid-20th century to the 1970s reveals a dynamic interplay between artistic innovation, societal transformation, and the quest for equality. So these are the ways that art is intricately woven with life. From the emergence of the movements like pop art and minimalism to the rise of conceptual, conceptual art and the exploration of feminist perspectives, artists continually pursue boundaries, challenge norms, and redefined the very essence of art. Pop art revolutionized the art world by introducing popular culture into artistic expression. Minimalism stripped art down to its essential forms, questioning the need for representation altogether. Conceptual art shifted the focus away from the object towards abstract ideas, sparking new dialogues about the nature of creativity and the nature of perception. At the same time, feminist movements within the art world sought to reclaim women's voices and women's narratives, challenging the historical exclusion of female artists and perspectives. Works like Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party not only celebrated women's achievements, but it also reimagined traditional craft techniques as powerful artistic mediums. Postmodernism will take these concepts further by questioning the very idea of a singular truth or meaning in art. Postmodernism opens up new avenues for artistic exploration and encourages artists to continue pursuing their passions and interests albeit within a framework that embraces ambiguity, embraces multiplicity, and constant reinvention. So we don't have time to cover that um, together, unfortunately, but I do encourage you to read the chapter on postmodernism and global art in your textbook. I also hope that you're interested in and your experience with art doesn't end with this course. Um, so I'm going to offer a few resources in the Canvas page for the course and also just mention a few here as well. So if you're looking to broaden your horizons, then you have a lot of avenues to explore. 
You can certainly take another art history course or take a studio art course for an elective if you're interested in that. We have beginning level courses that anyone can take, and it's a great way to get into the understanding art through the process of making, right? Um, museums and gallery visits. Take advantage of opportunities to visit museums. Um, any, even within rural areas, we have smaller galleries and museums that are a short drive away from our towns. Um, their websites are great resources for researching artists, but also for listing events. So I would encourage you to check out any museums that are within a few hours drive of your hometown, look at their websites and sign up for their email lists. And that way you'll have a constant kind of influx of some of the events that are happening in those areas so that you at least, even if you don't get a chance to go all the time, it stays in your awareness. That's a great way to keep in touch, keep in contact. But most towns also have arts councils and local galleries and arts events that you can attend that are open and free for anyone to attend. So check out your local university. Here at Louisiana Tech, we have a really active gallery program that is open to the public. We have an email list that anyone can get signed up for so that we can let you know about what exhibits and artist talks are coming soon. There's usually about six every, every academic year, and that's a great way to kind of keep in touch with what young artists are doing and also to just see a really diverse range of art. Um, also reading books and publications. There are local classes, so sometimes your regional arts councils can offer classes that don't have to do with the university that you can take maybe a day or two on a certain process, or I've taught color workshops that are usually that are a weekend long in the past. So there are short, there are, if you don't have a whole lot of time, there are even shorter opportunities for getting more experience and getting more exposure to different art, um, art opportunities in your area, right? I think engaging with the lo your local art community by going to artist talks or panel discussions and any of the art events that happen, that gives you a chance to connect with, with artists and art enthusiasts, so people who maybe have like interest and, and that way you start making connections and they can share some of the places and events that they enjoy going to and you start to build a whole community around this shared common interest. By engaging with any of these opportunities, you can continue to expand your knowledge to maybe get a few skills if you'd like um, and cultivate a lifelong passion for the arts. It's been my pleasure to share this course with you and I hope to see you at an art event or a gallery sometime in the future.